soft funding under the Special Development Fund window. All right, let's talk about now where the resources went. Because that is really what is important at the end of the day. Broadly speaking, 21% of our loans went to the education sector. Why is that so? Why does CDB consider that it should allocate such a large portion of its approvals to the education sector? And when I'm talking education here, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about the full spectrum. I'm talking about from basic right through to tertiary. Why is it that the CDB puts so much emphasis on education? The answer is a simple one. We recognize that given the endowments of our countries, and given the way in which the world is evolving today, if our people are not equipped with the educational skills to allow them to be functional, they will never be able to compete and make their place in this world. So that we recognize that we need to invest heavily in our people. And we want to do so through, among other things, the process of education. We're happy that our borrowing member countries recognize the importance of education and are prepared to invest themselves in that sector. So that 21% of our loans have gone to the education sector. The rest of the loans, I will speak to them being largely under the, uh, the grouping of infrastructure. 79% therefore of our loans went into the infrastructure sector. Let me go back now to education and give you a breakout of where the education spend went. Anguilla received a loan of $3.2 million. And this was uh, for a new Anguilla Community College where we strengthen instruct where we want to strengthen instructional and management capacity and improve quality, relevance, and the relevance of the program offerings. So we're building capacity in that important educational institution in Anguilla, one of our smallest member countries. The regional project that I made reference to is, uh, the, is what we call a, what's it called, Daydream? Uh, yeah. Open Campus, our Open Campus project, where what we have done is we have expanded and rehabilitated the sites in St. Lucia and in St. Vincent. So we, have, we are allocating $6.3 million to the campus in St. Lucia and $6.6 .6 million to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. What are we hoping to achieve there? We want to build <coughs> technological capacity for service delivery and we're designing, and the, the college is going to be designing new demand-driven training programs. One of the things that we recognize, and this is consistent with our primary emphasis and focus on the OECS countries is that many of these countries, in fact all of them, have no direct access to the educational programs offered by the University of the West Indies. Or they have access to them but in an insufficiently uh, acceptable manner. So what we are doing is working with the University of the West Indies to build that capacity to improve the quality of the offerings and the quality of the accommodations in, first of all, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and St. Lucia. This is a project that's very close to our heart and it is also very close to the heart of the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. Uh, for Antigua and Barbuda, they're getting $13.4 million, which represents an enhancement of the learning and teaching environment school management and instructional effectiveness, and educational planning and management at the pre-primary and secondary levels. And uh, on the grant side, ladies and gentlemen, Haiti is receiving a grant of 11 million US dollars, continuing on a program of work to improve the educational system in that member country of the Caribbean Development Bank. 
The focus here is on primary education and early childhood development for poor children and to enhance equity and governance in the sector. So that's education. Let me quickly move to what is happening on the infrastructure side. As I indicated, 79% of our approvals have gone to this, to this sector. Now, Guyana, the $25 million that Guyana has received is for a project which is to strengthen sea and river defense systems. So even though I have it under the category of infrastructure, I think those of you who were here last year would recognize that this approval is targeted towards climate adaptation, strengthening the resilience of Guyana to climate change. Under that same heading, uh, we also have approved $4.6 million to Barbados for improving drainage infrastructure to reduce flood hazards in Spikestone. That's, in, that's that important uh, secondary town on the west coast of Barbados. West coast, right, Bajans? <laughs> important project. The dominant expenditure, the dominant expenditure under the infrastructure category is $65 million, which has gone to uh, improving, the f to modernizing the fleet at Liat, 1974 Limited. All of the studies that I have seen in recent times on Caribbean uh, growth and competitiveness suggest that one of the constraints in that regard is the poor logistics infrastructure in this region. Whether you're talking about uh, sea transport or air transport. Now, there has been much criticism, and some of it well-deserved, of LIAT 1974 Limited. But ladies and gentlemen, I am one who has to utilize that airline very <laughs> frequently in my work. And most of my colleagues here at the CDB have to uh, experience the services on LIAT. And in spite of the great need for improvement, I think that we recognize that a Caribbean without a LIAT would be a very, very difficult Caribbean to navigate. So what is our attitude? Our attitude is that we need to work with that institution, as we are doing now, by building its capacity, by improving the quality of its services, so that it can help us to be more efficient in the delivery of air transport. And that's why we have delivered $65 million of our approvals to that entity. How have we done it? We have done it in the risk prudent manner of working through the shareholder countries. So that we have guarantees from the three, the four beneficiary countries. That's Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, um, Antigua and Barbuda, and Dominica. Commonwealth of Dominica. But those resources will not only be used to improve the quality of the fleet, and those of you who have flown on Liat recently, I think will appreciate how beautiful the ATR 42s and 72s are, a dramatic improvement. So that is to improve the quality of the infrastructure in air transport. We have also provided $11 million to the government to the, uh, well, to Belize, to improve, upgrade, and expand sections of its transmission and distribution system. That is an economy that's growing fairly rapidly, and uh, as they grow, their demand for electricity and the need for greater reliability in the supply of electricity is vitally needed. So we're happy to be able to make that loan. There are two small loans which we have made, small in dollar value, 750,000 each, but very, very important. One to Dominica, the other one to the Bahamas. This is an immediate response loan. This is a facility that we provide to our countries in the aftermath of natural disasters. So ladies and gentlemen, in a nutshell, that is where the vast majority of our approvals have gone. Let me move now to some of the other highlights of our operation. I made mention earlier of Suriname. If I talk a little bit too much about Suriname, it is because I'm especially excited about 
uh, the accession of that country to membership in the Caribbean Development Bank. Suriname deserves to be in CDB because Suriname is going to be a very, very important link between the Caribbean and South America. Both the Guyanese and the Surinamese talk about being the frontiers to South America. I don't think there's any competition. We regard them as both very, very key to our linkage to that, that critical continent. So that Suriname is now on board. Why is Suriname so important apart from the fact that they are on the South American continent and border Brazil and other important countries? Suriname is key to us because it represents new opportunity for development. It represents an occasion for us to share with that country the development experience that we have gained through more than 40 years of operation in the other member countries of this region. We think that Suriname can learn from us. But we are not so arrogant, ladies and gentlemen, to believe that Suriname has nothing to teach the Caribbean Development Bank and the rest of our Bahrain member countries. I visited that country a few weeks ago, and it is nothing short of impressive, some of the developments that are taking place there. And we want to help Suriname, and we know that Suriname is going to help us. From a risk perspective, from a risk perspective, Suriname is vital. Because one of the...